Hey guys, this is Carl Jin of Mo Jian Bing. Today I want to talk about Ba Mian Jian or eight sided swords. As you can see, I have two swords here today, and both these were sent to me by LK Chen to make a video review of, and then I will be sending them back sometime soon. On the right here, I have the magnificent Chu Jian, and then here on the left, I have the LK Chen Soaring Sky. Both of these swords are what's known as Ba Mian Jian or eight sided Jian because they have a central ridge running along the blade, and then they also have an additional ridge for each edge and that's on both sides and therefore you get eight faces or eight sides. So the eight-sided sword design comes from the Chinese Bronze Age and I haven't talked much about Bronze Age weapons on this channel because I don't have that much access to them. They're pretty hard to get a hold of but I do think that having this eight-sided sword here provides a good opportunity to talk about that some. In particular the Chu Jian serves as a prime example of how China transitioned from bronze to steel. So why would bronze swords have an eight-sided design like this? And it basically comes down to durability, in my opinion. Essentially, if you have a thick spine, it will help prevent a bronze sword from flexing like it tends to do. And then also, if you have a wide edge angle, it does not cut as well, but it keeps a much more durable edge that won't break and warp as easily. However, China stands out among many Bronze Age cultures in the world because the Bronze Age kind of lasted quite a bit longer there. For example, in the Near East, the transition from bronze to iron was really taking place around the year 800 BC or so. However, in China, you still have massive amounts of bronze weapons being produced and used, you know, up to 400 years later. And there's a few reasons as to why that might be. So the first thing to know about the end of the Bronze Age and the transition towards the Iron Age is that it didn't actually happen because iron weapons are better than bronze weapons. Early Iron Age weapons are honestly not that good compared to modern standards, and they were not any better than bronze weapons at the time. And you could, in many cases, find bronze weapons that were much better than many run-of-the-mill iron blades. However, the advantage that iron has over bronze is that it's cheap and it's readily available. Bronze requires, you know, copper and tin, and tin in particular is quite rare in the ancient world and you know finding a good tin mine is important and crucial when you know empires rose and fell based off the tin trade but iron was just everywhere so that's really why the transition to iron took off and it was only after the iron age had been going for a while that they actually started to more consistently produce alloys that would be much stronger than bronze so there are likely a myriad of reasons why iron the Iron Age didn't happen at the same time in China as it did the rest of the world. Uh, one important one to start out with is we don't understand exactly when and how iron got to China or possibly was independently invented in China. Now, most scholars on this subject will say that iron definitely got to China, and we know that there was bloomery iron in the Tarim Basin as early as the 9th century BC, but there are still people who advocate for an indigenous uh, invention of iron. And we do have some bloomery iron production in the Central Plains region during the spring and autumn period. But what really brought iron to the forefront in China was the blast furnace. I'm not going to get into all the technical details, but a blast furnace is kind of like a souped up version of a regular furnace. And instead of just kind of softening the iron alloy and making it where you can kind of work with it, a blast furnace can actually melt the iron and then you can do more things with it. However, the result, uh, the product that you get out of a blast furnace is actually cast iron, which is no good for making weapons because it has much too high of a carbon content and it's actually quite brittle. During the late spring and autumn period in China, around the 5th century, we see that the blast furnace and cast iron starts to become quite common. Um, because it, you know you can readily cast all kinds of things repeatedly and make a whole bunch of implements, but it's actually not used for weapons because it is not good enough to be used for weapons. They actually make a lot of things like plowshares and belt hooks and stuff like that. What this does is it actually allows the competing states in the region to you know use iron for everything that's not a weapon and actually save all of their tin and bronze to make better weapons. Another reason why the Bronze Age might have lasted a little bit longer in China than other parts of the world is because China was experimenting with using bronze in unique ways that I haven't seen anywhere else. The best example of this is probably what's called the bimetallic or the composite 
bronze sword. This is made by first casting a core out of a, you know, 10% tin content bronze alloy. And then you actually take that core and then you cast a separate edge onto it that's a different alloy. It's actually more like, you know, 18 to 20% tin, which will normally, that would be too brittle for a sword, but you're only putting it on the edge. And therefore you can have a sharper, harder edge on a softer bronze spine. This practice was continued and also used on other weapons and it even even Han Dynasty you know crossbow bolt heads would be sometimes made in ways like this. This practice of using multiple different alloys and multicast weapons is something that I haven't seen in other parts of the world in the Bronze Age uh, but it is very unique and interesting and I would really like to see more research done on this so we have an idea of what is the real capability of these types of things. However, although bronze weapons were still quite common during the Chinese Warring States period, there's actually an ongoing transition to relatively good quality iron weapons as well as steel weapons, and the magnificent Chu Jian is a perfect example of this. So during the High Warring States period, you essentially have seven major states vying for power in the Central Plains, and the states of Yan and Chu were particularly famous for the quality of their iron and steel. What the magnificent Chu Jian really is, is simply a steel version of a bronze sword that's kind of stretched out. So if we take a look at the fittings, we can see that on the pommel, we have a bunch of concentric rings. And this was a thing that was common on bronze blades. And it's a, you know, the concentric rings are very difficult to produce. And there's been studies done on exactly how they make so many concentric rings when they cast. And it's probably some kind of you know, spinning implement, uh, but regardless of that, that's a feature that's directly on many bronze blades, and it also helps prevent your hand from sliding off the grip. If we take a look at the guard, we can see that it has a Taotia motif. Now, the Taotia is a monster, and it was depicted on all manner of bronzes from the Shang and Zhou dynasties, and basically, whenever you make a ritual sacrifice, a lot of the time, you will put your rice or your you know, alcohol into a vessel that has a Taltia on it. The shape of the scabbard also has the design that's quite reminiscent of the Taltia or the Shomian Wind motif, but it's actually somewhat opposite because the design on the shape is actually raised out, whereas the design on the guard is actually a kind of relief carved in. Another thing to note about the scabbard is that it has this pretty stylistic uh, red, black, and yellow paint on it, and it looks pretty cool. In addition to that, you have the single bronze loop for the belt, which was, you know, standard during this period. If you look at the scabbard, you also notice that it's like wasted, where it's wider up towards where you, the hand guard is, and then it narrows out towards the tip, and it has this particular transition point about two-thirds down the blade. That's also something that features on the steel sword, it's just very subtle. And this was very prominent on earlier bronze swords, presumably so that you could have a very good thrusting tip. Also, if you take a look at the quarter out handle, you notice that it has certain segments which are you know, thicker, and that actually helps you grip the blade really well. That's also something that exists on many bronze blades, except bronze blades would actually have a cast on handle, and it would actually have, you know, sometimes it would have bronze discs which protrude out of those parts. And uh, so we can see that pretty much everything about the design of this sword is uh, kind of a replication and an extension of Chinese Bronze Age blades. But this design didn't stick around forever, and if we take a look at the Han Dynasty Ba Mian Jian, we can see that there's quite a few changes. For one, you notice this blade is quite a bit longer than the Chu Jian, and that has to do with continual advancements in metallurgy. By the time of the Han Dynasty, China had some very advanced metallurgy. They were able to, you know, produce pretty good quality steel, and then they would also understand the properties of those steel very consistently and be able to use it in a blade in the right place. For example, softer steel for the spine, harder steel for the edge. They would also, you know, had different types of heat treatment. They could temper it all the way through to make it like a spring or they would dif differentially heat treat it where you can get a, you know, like a hardened edge. So there's a lot going on, and because of that, you can start to produce these long, straight blades. Also, during the time of the Han Dynasty, the Ba Mian Jian was no longer the standard type of Jian. The diamond cross-section actually took over in part because of the 
better properties of steel and that you don't actually have to have such a thick rind to your edge to keep it durable. So during the Han Dynasty, you know, you have these very elite, fancy Ba Mian Jian. Uh, but interestingly, the guard on the sword is a little bit simplistic. The pommel also has this nice floral motif, and that would actually look quite good if you're wearing the sword, and that would be presented out to the open where everyone could see it. So, you know, decorating your pommel, and it's a disc pommel, it gives you a very nice surface to kind of, you know, present your blade. But I think the elite nature of the sword really starts to be obvious whenever we take a look at the scabbard. So, we can see that it has a complex, uh, just a lot going on. <laughs> We have every part of this has, you know, some kind of design, essentially. Uh, on the, you know, the belt hook, it has this very ancient type of, you know, dotted pattern, which is called a guwen, and it's basically based off millet. Uh, and then we have a rhomboid design that's in red, as well as this cloud design, or yuinwen, uh, which has these swirling lines. And then, in addition, if we look at the shape of this scabbard, we also have an interesting, you know, circular slash square type design. Now, a scabbard like this was obviously meant to be a very high luxury item back in the Han Dynasty, and it does look quite nice, but I do think that it is fairly clear that it's not the same as it would have been in the past. It looks a little bit modern, and you can tell that it's kind of, you know, uh, sticker or a decal that's been put on the scabbard it's not a handcrafted object and that's essentially due to price it would if you if you want to have the real you know you could even get these fittings in jade if you really wanted to go all out uh, that's not something that LK Chen offers because of complications with shipping jewelry overseas uh, but in the past you know the getting this uh, nice handcrafted uh, object like this would be extremely expensive and would definitely show your status. The geometry of the Han Dynasty Ba Mian Jian is also quite a bit different than the Magnificent Chu Jian because it doesn't have deep fullers that are on the flat surfaces of the, of the blade. And that makes this blade quite stiff and robust, And uh, but it actually doesn't really make it, you know, the thinnest, best cutting profile ever. But it would definitely be uh, very functional sword and in addition that stiffness would actually lend you to increasing the length and you know making it a very good thrusting weapon. If we talk about handling I think that both of these swords feel very nice to you know swing around and the Chu Jian in particular I find that the length and the balance on it just is very nice. It's important to say though that we don't know how any of these blades were really used and you could use these swords in multiple ways and that doesn't mean that you know exactly which ways they used them in the past so whenever I was messing around with these you know I found that the Chu Jian was very nice and just using kind of one-handed swordsmanship and the grip is a little bit small to put two hands on it but whenever I was using the Storing Sky I mean you can definitely use this sword with one hand it's perfectly good for that but I found that it was very uh, fast and fun to use it with two hands. And because we don't really know how these were used, I just kind of had a little fun and, you know, did some German longsword techniques. And, you know, you might say, you know, you could do this with them and that for therefore they did do it with them in the past. I wouldn't say that's accurate. I would just say, you know, there's a million things you can do with this sword and I just did a few of them.
So this is my video review of the LK Chun Magnificent Chu Tian as well as the Soaring Sky. And both of these Ba Mian Tian are very fun to use. They, you know, have a lot of interesting aspects that make them unique from any other blades. In addition to that, I really think the 8-sided Jin is interesting because the status symbol that connects these, you know, early steel swords back to the Bronze Age in China. If you'd be interested in purchasing any of these blades, then check out the link below in the description. As always, thank you all for watching. Please subscribe and don't forget to stay sharp.